is Warren Vanderhoe with the Center for Middletown Studies Project on Muncie Faith Communities. And today I'm speaking with Rory Vaughn, the senior pastor of Grace Baptist Church. The date is January 31, 2017. And, and Rory, I'd like to begin by asking you to tell me about your faith journey, how you became a pastor. I've been, um, I was raised in a Christian home. My mom and dad were um, saved when I was five years old. And uh, they began attending a church there in Pekin, Illinois, where I'm from. And uh, so we grew up going to church and uh, we're very active. Um, I remember my dad became a, a deacon in that church not too long after we started going to the church. And um, what really, uh, changed probably my life was when our church started our Christian school when I was in second grade in 1976. I went to Faith Baptist Christian School from second grade through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. Also another big um, thing that happened in my life was um, we got a youth pastor in 1980 that became a huge mentor to me. And um, I was saved at a young age in junior high, um, began my walk with the Lord there, was baptized, and then I felt the Lord calling me to preach through the through the preaching of God's word. And um, of course, as a young person, it scares you to death. Um, and uh, you know, I said, I can't get up and talk and, and things like that. But as God kept leading me and guiding me, especially through the youth program there at that church and going to summer camps and being in the Christian school there, I did feel the tug of God's call upon my life. And I believe it, was a, it is a calling. Um, and I didn't know where exactly I was gonna end up, but I knew I had to go off and get training um, I did go off and get um, training at Bible College and then came back and uh, served at my home church there in Pekin, Illinois for six and a half years. And then one day in um, the summer of 1997, Dr. Collins Glenn, uh, who was the pastor here at this church for 45 years, he called me up and he said, hey, I want you to come visit me and uh, we need a youth pastor. And so we did. My wife and I had three kids at the time and then um, we did feel the Lord's call here to Grace Baptist Church, and we've been here ever since. So I'm in my 20th year here at this church preaching the Word of God. And it's been a, it's been a great journey. It's been a great journey. We've seen a lot of things good happen. And um, the Lord has been gracious enough to use me in spite of myself. You mentioned, uh, where did you uh, go to college? I went to Bob Jones University, 1987 to 91. Was, it, was that fairly typical of people from your congregation to go to Bob Jones? Yeah, yes, I would say that we used um, Bob Jones University and some other uh, Baptist Bible colleges. Um, and I really felt like the Lord wanted me there at Bob Jones. And uh, we visited there in the summer of my sophomore year. And uh, mom and dad really felt like this would be a great place to go. And I did feel God called me there. What, what do you see as your main responsibilities here at GBC? Well, the Bible says as the pastor, I'm to shepherd the flock of God. And I think really when you break that down, it involves two things. It involves um, evangelism, which is making disciples, telling people about the Lord, um, making them aware of God's plan for their life, letting them know that um, there is a solution to their sin, and that's the Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and then also edifying the body of Christ as well and building them up. I'm not the one that's supposed to be doing all the work here. The Bible says that I am training people, I'm equipping the, uh, the people here at Grace Baptist Church to go and do the work of the ministry in Ephesians chapter four. So um, that is what I see as my main job. Um, and so um, on a day-to-day -day basis, that takes on different roles and responsibilities, a lot of preparation for preaching. I try to keep preaching as primary from the word of God. And so there's a lot of prep time for preaching. Um, I'm probably preaching four or five times a week, depending on if I'm preaching in the school or in our senior citizens program, uh, Sunday school, morning service, evening service, Wednesday night. So, um, of course, we have a multifaceted right. ministry here as well. Right. Right. How would you characterize the condition of Grace Baptist right now? I would say, I mean, everybody's going to say this, but I would say that it's a healthy congregation right now. I would say there's a whole lot of unity here. Um, I would say that uh, the people are excited about being together and feel a sense of community. Um, uh, and I'll talk about that community a little bit more when you ask me about it, but um, it's, um, there's a sense of anticipation, I think, of God doing some good things here. What's your, has your membership fluctuated much in the last few decades? 
I would say that it really, I mean, when I first came in 1997, we were running around 500 on an average on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And um, we've been smaller than that. We are running about 400, 425 on a Sunday morning right now. Um, we have been building back up. We did have a, we did have a little while there where I would say in the uh, 2008, 9, 10, that we had a rough stretch um, there, but um, we've, we've just seen a, um, some growth. We have welcomed a lot of new members in yeah. um, and things, so it's been, it's been good. How, how do you account, what you uh, want to pick up on that term, rough patch, or what, mm -hmm. what, did anything specific happen? Um, I would say that uh, I would say that when I came in 1997, the ABB, the the, the uh, factory ABB closed down. Okay. Um, Chevrolet was closing down. Ball Corp was moving out um, at that time, and we had people working in all those. And then in 2008 um, or nine, uh, Borg Warner closed down, and so some of that would account for some loss of membership where people had to move um, but I would also say there were other some some other mitigating factors mm -hmm. there as well with aging aging uh, pastoral staff and, and pastor and stuff uh, aside from membership what, what are some of the key challenges that a church like Grace Baptist faces right now well we have the Christian school and um, so that is a unique thing to our church not all churches have a Christian school, um, but we've had Heritage Hall Christian School here for 50 years. And so, I mean, the school brings its own unique ch challenges with it. Um, uh, I would say that uh, the logistics and calendar, um, finances, things like that, that um, we all have to keep track of would be, yeah. would be something that is a, is a constant challenge. Um, but I have good people around me. I've brought on several staff members and um, we have a lot of um, a lot of people that have come around me to to help in the work, and so um, I wouldn't say it's a burden um, yeah. to come in the office every day or to get up in the pulpit. I'm blessed, let me tell you. Yeah. So um, our people really are are behind what we're doing here. Talk a bit more about the school. I mean, you're the only congregation that I know of that has a K-12. Right. And what, what's the history of Heritage Hall? Really, back in the um, Back in the late '60s, a group of men got together that were concerned about, of course, taking prayer out of the Christian, out of the public schools, right. um, and a lot of the uh, other things that were going on at, at that time. There were riots going on and different things. Uh, they wanted to place patriotism back into it, which that's why I think our motto or our, our mascot is the Heritage Hall Patriots. Mm -hmm. um, and they started really over on Walnut Street as a separate entity. And um, they didn't have much, and then most of the men were from Grace Baptist Church that started that. And they came under the auspices of Grace Baptist Church a few years after they had, they had began that school. So um, I would say that it, it was born out of a, a love for um, God's Word, uh, for our Christian heritage here in the United States, um, conservative principles, um, and teaching our children those and passing them down right. to them. Right. So, Has the enrollment fluctuated much? Yes, when I first came in 1997, we probably were over 400 students. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Dennis Ice, who was the headmaster of the school at that time, um, uh, realized that um, uh, we needed to have a, a unity of spirit within that uh, student body. And so um, I think uh, we were more selective in bringing students in. But it dwindled a little bit um, every year. But in 2008, we really saw a downturn with the economy. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, parents pay for their kids to be here and over and above everything else, and it wasn't cheap. And so um, we tried to make it as affordable as possible, but yeah. there was just parents that couldn't do it, losing their jobs and things. So, um, but with the school choice program that's in Indiana now, I believe it's revitalized it. I think we got down to about 168 students at one time, and now we're above 200. Okay. So but it's a good size. this is not just children from Grace Baptist Church? No, this is m the majority of the kids come from um, the community. Okay. Yep. What role do you see for Grace Baptist Church in the wider Muncie, Delaware County community? I think that role has expanded over the years. Um, 
I think Grace Baptist was seen as um, a white collar church at one time, um, although it never really had that flavor when I came here. Um, but I think it was, there was a perception with that. But about 10 years ago, we started a Reformers Unanimous program, which is a biblically-based addictions um, recovery program. And that changed the face of our church. I mean, it literally did. Um, it made um, us aware of the problems that are out there that communities are facing, um, that families are facing. Um, it has changed lives. We are in the Delaware County Jail um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays with a men's class and a women's class, seeing great things done there. A lot of our men here uh, belong to the Gideons International, and they go up and preach on Sundays for services in the jail. And so um, that has really changed the face of our church. We have meth addicts um, that are former meth addicts that are here. We have former prostitutes that are here. We have former um, uh, heroin addicts and, and drunks and uh, you name it, you know, gambling addicts. Anything that they have struggled with, um, it has opened up the doors for that, and that has opened up a wider um, ministry in the community. Was that a conscious decision on the part of your leadership and the congregation, your staff, to say we really need to do more to reach out to some of these groups? Yes, because historically churches, and, and I'll say Baptist churches, um, did not know how to deal with that aspect of the community. But um, this program, um, even though it's biblically based, is working, is working tremendously. And um, uh, we have one step, and that's First of all, you need to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and then we go from there. So he has to change it from the inside out. Uh, as you know, and we've spoken about this before, that Muncie has really been experiencing considerable economic and social change in the last few decades. In what ways have these changes specifically impacted this congregation? I would say that um, I would say that it, it most, mostly impacted us with people having to leave to go find work. And that culminated in a pretty bad, pretty bad year, um, both for the school and for the church, 2009, 10, 2011, 12, right in through there, um, where things got a little, um, uh, a little tight financially. And, and churches all across America, we were hearing, were having to drop missionaries and uh, Christian schools were closing down and um, things were going on, but the, I will say this, the people here at Grace Baptist Church were well taught under Dr. Collins Glenn, and they knew how to give. And um, the year after I became pastor, it's not because I became pastor, I believe it's because the people just had a mind for it. We had the best offerings on record, and really we continue to have the best offerings so far. Um, it's, not, it's not bragging, it's bragging on God's goodness to us. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, once again, the jobs aren't necessarily the same as they used to be here, but the people really have a mind to give, and when the people see that um, their dollars and dimes are going for the Lord's work, they're going to give to it. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to mention specific names, but could you give me some examples of people in the congregation and how their lives were specifically impacted by these kinds of changes? I know of men that were working at Borg Warner when it closed down that have had to go into self-employment um, on their own now. I know of men um, that did move away, solid men, um, that were biblically grounded here and we hated losing them, but God moved them into other states and ministries. Um, just recently, I know of one of our church members that um, the Star Press had to let them go because it's of its waning um, uh, readership and things like that, I think. so. It's still ongoing, but for the most part, I would say that all of our people are gainfully mm -hmm. employed. Has the, the commitment that the church has to dealing with the economic, social, economic and social changes in Muncie changed over the years? I would say with the Reformers Unanimous program, it has changed. Um, I would say that well, when we the, started... Where did, Reformers, where did that program come from? It came out of um, Rockford, Illinois, um, and a man who had grown up in a Christian school, probably about my age. Uh, he, um, he got away from the Lord and uh, was in a terrible car accident. Uh, God used that to straighten him out and uh, to get him on the right path again. He had been in drugs and alcohol. And, um, but he, God used this man to, um, to develop this program under the auspices of the church up there in Rockford, Illinois. And uh, it, is, it is nationwide, it's worldwide. 
and um, it has become a, a very good program. Um, every Friday night at 7 o'clock, you can guarantee that they're going to have Reformers Unanimous here. If it's Christmas, it doesn't matter. They're always here. So, This may be a really silly question, but how, how did you find out about this? I think we found out about it through our circles, and um, we had talked about starting this program a few years before we actually did. It, just, it, takes, it takes a dedicated group of people to run it every Friday night, you know, and they have a dedicated cell phone that people can call them and say, hey, I'm having a rough time here or I need your help. Um, and they're, they're on call 24-7. Mm -hmm. They're unpaid staff of our church. Well, I was going to ask you if you could give me some specific examples of programs that the church has initiated to respond to the community's economic dislocation, but that's certainly one, but I mean, there might be some others. That you right. I think um, we have a food pantry that we have always utilized um, in the community when we started our Living Christmas Tree program in 1990. Uh, we only asked that the community bring canned goods in for that mm -hmm. food pantry, right. and uh, we have always been a place where you can come and get food no matter what. Um, we've paid a lot of bills in the community for rent and heat and electricity. Our, our church takes up a benevolence offering every last Sunday, um, and we use that for that as well. Um, we get into the community through our school as well. Uh, we also get into the community through uh, various events um, that we will go and be a part of. Our women's group will be a part of certain things and, yeah. and things too. So, Do you have other programs that are kind of on the front or middle burner right now that you're thinking about? As far as beginning them? Yeah, I mean, or getting more involved in some of these pro different ones. I think there's some things that we've been contacted with. Um, you know, one aspect, of course, we would very strongly believe in the right to life and um, the First Choice for Women Center mm -hmm. here in Muncie, and they're expanding into Anderson. Um, we are probably going to take them on for support monthly. Mm -hmm. um, the director, Lisa Miller, goes to our church here. Um, and um, I've been over there to see their operation, and they're on the front lines of, of ministry every single day. Um, and so we're, we're getting more active in that. I would say at their last banquet, at their last fundraiser banquet, we probably had four tables full of just Grace Baptist Church affiliated people. Mm -hmm. And um, that's one way we're getting more involved as well, I think, too. Don't, don't see this as a silly sidebar question, but I'll just play it out. If I, I'm, I'm the person on the street and I come to you and I say, What's this living Christmas tree? How would you respond to that? Right. I say it's a 35-foot um, tall structure uh, that goes 270 degrees, and we hold our choir in it with about 65 or 70 people in it. And um, I forget how many lights they've got on it. Um, but they're all synchronized, and it takes a lot of manpower to put the thing up. So, uh, Where did that idea come from? I think back in the late 80s there and, and early 90s, they... Um, they had heard of people doing a structure. Really, it's just a structure to hold the choir, sure. but um, it's it's a massive structure, yeah. and uh, it um, it goes all the way from the floor to the speaker array uh, there as well. So it's um it's big. But they went and looked at different styles of living Christmas trees, and um, one of our former members, who was a city engineer and a Ball State engineer, Arlen Kirkland, mm -hmm. him and Charlie Staten, contractor here in this town for years, uh, built it and tore it down and put it back up. So, yep. What role do you see for churches in cultivating what I would call a sense of citizenship in a community? And when you say citizenship, are you talking about um, being a United States citizen? Are you talking about active, actively participating in the process of the, of the community? I, I think it's, let's start with the community. Okay. Um, I think that it's not our number one goal here at Grace Baptist to be out on the front lines, um, maybe picketing or yeah, right. um, protesting or something like that. We try to keep... The main thing that we do here, um, ensuring that we can give the gospel of Jesus Christ out um, at any time. That's the main thing we try to do. As far as social change, we would believe that social change would come about because of a heart change. Um, as people come to know the Lord and read his word and find out what he desires from them, then they begin to change and society changes as a result of that. Um, definitely there are things that we feel strongly about because God's word has spoken to those things 
Um, and, and so in the relationship to like uh, first choice for women or something like that, we would be, we would be um, ready to support that type of a ministry. Um, you know, we, and we try, to, um, we try to help anybody who's hurting, obviously, and taking into consideration their spiritual needs first and then their physical needs, emotional needs. We have a counseling center across the street where people may not come into a church, but they'll go to this counseling center and it's free, it's free of charge. Um, we don't charge for our living Christmas tree, we don't charge for counseling, we don't, um, we're not here to make money, okay? Um, we're here to do the work that God has called us to do. So um, as far as getting into the community and helping, I think we have been doing that more and more um, uh, through, through the various things that we have tried to fund and, and uh, involve ourselves with. The, the biggest thing I think being our jail ministry and our addictions recovery ministry. This doesn't specifically apply to what we're talking about here, but I'm just kind of interested in it because when my wife and I were here for your service, you, you have a really significant commitment to foreign missions. Yes, um, we do. We believe, you know, the Great Commission said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that is the job of the local church uh, to do that. We support independent missionaries that um, come through and um, present their ministries and their burden for their field. Mm -hmm and the church um, decides whether or not to take them on mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe um, a cooperative effort or something like right. that among churches. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have 40 missionaries around the world, um, some from our church and some that we are just their, their supporting church. Kind of spinning off from that, do you have specific programs where you work with other churches in the community or other, other uh, religious organizations? We, um, we hold youth, um, group activities together with various churches in Anderson and Newcastle. Um, we would also, a lot of our interaction with other churches comes in the form of athletics yeah. um, and academic competition between other Christian schools and, and churches that we would affiliate with and they have Christian schools. Yeah. And so um, it's interesting to note that the Christian school has taken the place of what churches used to do in that, whereas Back in the day, youth groups used to compete against each other. When the Christian school came about, now it's the Christian schools competing against each other um, and uh, doing things that the youth group used to be, you know, have, have sole order over. So, Do you think there's a connection, going back to that question about faith and citizenship, do you think there is a connection between faith and citizenship, somebody's faith and being a good citizen? I think being a Christian would make them the best citizen. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 13, uh, being subject to the higher powers. Um, no power is in power, but what God has given to them. And so we believe that. Um, we would try to be good citizens on that. Um, Peter um, did stand up for the Lord in the book of Acts, and he said we ought to obey God rather than men when they told him not to preach the gospel anymore. And so when the Bible comes into conflict with government, um, we're gonna we're always gonna have to side with the Bible yeah we're gonna have to answer to God for that one day well those are the only formal questions I have but at, at the end of each interview I want to give the person I'm speaking with an opportunity to add anything you might wish well at the uh, risk of seeming empty-minded. I don't really don't have anything, but <laughs> no, <you're not. laughs> um, um, I think what you guys are doing here um, is an interesting concept as far as going to the churches and seeing how things have impacted the faith mm -hmm. uh, groups in this county and in the city really in Muncie. Um, uh, since we've been here in Muncie, um, it's, a, it's a great town. Um, some people downplay it, mm -hmm. but it, it's a matter of perspective uh, where you come from. Um, the town I come from is less than half the size of Muncie. Right. Um, Muncie's um, got a lot of good things going for it. It's still the Midwest. I like that. Um, I'm a mid Midwestern boy, really, and um, and so it's been a it's been um, like coming home, and it is my home. I've lived here longer now than I lived in my hometown. So it's just out of curiosity, since you're from Pekin, and I have some friends there too, as I think I told you about. Uh -huh. Has Pekin suffered the same kinds of economic difficulties as Muncie? I would say um, that as Caterpillar Tractor Company goes in that area, so goes the community. And Caterpillar is doing pretty well right now. And, um, but I, I have known days where they weren't and it was economically depressed. So 
you know, I mean, we're almost directly across east here on I-74, so uh, we get the same weather, and uh, we have a lot of the same things going on. So, um, but I, I would say that um, that Peoria area, Central Illinois, is doing is doing okay. Yeah. I wish I could say the same thing for the state of Illinois. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Upstate is one thing. Yeah. Uh, downstate wishes they were their own state. Yeah. So thank you very, very much for taking the time to participate. My privilege. Thank you, Dr. Vanderhill. Thank Appreciate you. it.